Um, okay, so today my purpose is to uh, introduce what we do at the Research Institute. And uh, of course, as Professor Cardi has just mentioned, we have signed a comprehensive uh, cooperative agreement between WIN and NIMS. And that, the meaning of that is uh, whenever you want to, for instance, as <coughs> Professor Carty has mentioned, if you want to come to us as an uh, undergraduate intern, we will support that. And by support, we mean we provide the local expenses and what else, other, other support. Uh, also, at the uh, professional research level, we would like to have collaboration uh, in many areas. And I think since uh, the area that you cover, the professional or technological and scientific areas that you cover uh, are generally covered by us also, so we'll have plenty of opportunity to work together. And uh, we are very happy to uh, promote this. So, so the purpose of my talk today is to tell you what we do and how it's done and so forth. So first of all, it's called the National Institute for Material Science. We call it NIMS very often. We have three sites, uh, these three sites, and we are located in a place called Tsukuba, uh, about 40 to 50 kilometers north of Tokyo. So you can get there by a, something called Tsukuba Express. Uh, you can get there in 45 minutes. So if you're in Tokyo, it's easy to get there. Uh, let's see. Okay, what is NIMS? Well, this gives you sort of a quick history of how this institute was built. Uh, there used to be two institutes, National Research Institute of Metals and National Institute for Inorganic Materials. So they got merged in 2001 and now it's uh, called National Institute for Material Science. Uh, our mission is defined by the government law, and that tells you that we are supposed to carry out generic infrastructural technology, basic research and development, and the dissemination of results, and pro promotion of the applications, that's collaboration with industries and uh, other, other institutions share the use of NIMS facilities and equipment. Since we have many uh, large scale equipment for material science, for instance, very large magnets, uh, very large, uh, let's see, uh, microscopes, or very high pressure uh, facilities, to, for instance, to make diamond crystals at high, high pressure, high temperature. Uh, training of researchers and engineers. That's where you come in. <laughs> and, oh, this, okay. So I thought I'll give you a, this is too complicated to, for you to follow. So what I'm going to do is give you what's important. Um, see, the Japanese government runs science and technology plants every five years. We define a plan for five years and we set target. Well, from the scientist's point of view, the important thing is how much do we expect to spend in the next five years? So many billion dollars. <laughs> and anyway, for five years, and this is our third five year, the, it start, has just started April 2011. And so we go on with a plan for five years. And you know what we decide, Actually, I was involved in formulating this uh, governmental plan. Uh, but because of this big earthquake that interrupted many of our uh, facilities, power plants, and so forth, uh, the government is in the process of revising it a little because we will have to spend a lot of money uh, recovering or repairing the damages caused by the earthquake and uh, tsunami. So. Uh, so, but, uh, let's see. So, we, our main emphasis in the next 
five years will be uh, environment and energy. And about three years ago, what, uh, we, our government has set a um, goal to cut back on the CO2 uh, emission by 20% or 20%, I think, by 2015. And so, so environment and energy became a very important issue. For It's, a, it's a basically a, a homework given to the science and technology community to, to realize. So we have to find solutions. And we thought we, uh, we can make, probably manage it with uh, more uh, nuclear power. But now that's not going to be the case, so we have to think of other ways, some other wise ways uh, to solve that problem. And so um, in the institute, we have, uh, let's see, 12 units. Unit is basically a group or a uh, of about up to a dozen people. And so 12 units, oh wait a minute, I must be skipping something. Uh, okay, I guess not. Okay, so let's skip this slide because I'll show you. It's even worse. <laughs> well, uh, oh wait a minute. It's a, it's a little complicated, but uh, that's where I am. <laughs> and uh, we have various fellows and so forth and so forth. But the important thing is we have three basic divisions, Environment and Energy Materials Division, and International Center for Materials Nano Architectonics. This is a special division. I will tell you more about it. And uh, Advanced Key T Technology Division. This is and also, uh, let's see, this section is uh, research network and facility services. This is a section that services uh, or provides shared equipment for research community nationwide and possibly internationally as well. Uh, so that's the section. And, and this part deals with nanotechnology with all sorts of groups. See, we have 17 units, one foundry. We have, uh, uh, let's see, where is it? Foundry here. We can uh, fabricate semiconductor devices. Also, we have biomaterial units to work with bio -mater biological materials. And this section, Advanced Key Technologies Division, this section is basically, uh, uh, measuring, testing. For instance, characterization, processing, uh, surface physics, quantum beam unit. This, was, this is neutron scattering uh, sp uh, spring eight, that's uh, uh, synchrotron radiation source. And let's see. Basic, oh, this is supposed to give you a general idea of the scale of, uh, of the institute. So if you're talking about the business, the annual sale is about $220 million US dollars. And we spend, that's the income, but you see most of that is an operating subsidy coming from the government. So that's a national laboratory. And then we get various income from uh, research. Uh, th this comes from research contract with the industries. Uh, let's see. Subsidy for facilities. Oh, that's government money also. So mostly the income is government. And um, wha how we spend it, uh, personnel, personnel expenses, that's, that's the salary. And this is mostly uh, supplies and actual research money. And let's see what else is interesting. Not that much interesting here. Basically, what you want to know is 
you know, this expenditure is about 200 million US dollars per year. And we have, let's see, oh, so many people. Uh, this is money again. So uh, let's see, where is it? Oh, this, this is just telling you that the, our budget is increasing and different parts of the money come from, you know, this one, for instance, is a, uh, uh, let's see, where is that from? Oh, okay. So you will see various uh, funding sources. N notice one is uh, atomic power testing research. That has to do with the you know, strength of steel against new, uh, neutron radiation, things like that. That used to be a very uh, important area for the institute. But uh, you know the general student interest in such things has declined greatly in the past 20 years. So that may be one of the reasons why we have problems with the <laughs> nuclear power plant. You know, uh, this is on the side, but uh, you know, universities, they used to have nuclear power engineering. But nuclear power engineer, nuclear sounding things got to be very unpopular with students. So many universities started calling it uh, quantum energy engineering. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so, you know, there aren't that many people who are majoring in straight out nuclear power engineering these days. That's our problem. Anyway, uh, this is probably not that interesting to you, but uh, what we get is uh, from the universe, oh, from our institute's point of view, uh, this, uh, this, uh, figure is very important because the source of the income is changing very rapidly from the government to more industry and more competitive uh, grants. Uh, number of people, oh, one thing that uh, this data is supposed to emphasize is that we have a very large number of foreign staff members and uh, the Japanese government is pushing for more and more foreign participation in our research environment. So we, it turns out we are one of the best ones in terms of the uh, internationalization of the staff. Um, you notice uh, we have about, as I was saying, about 1,500 or 1,400 uh, staff members and uh, about, uh, let's see, about a 20% is from abroad. And this tells you, let's see, is Canada. Okay, Canada is a very large <coughs> group, but you notice standing right next to China, <laughs> one fiftieth. Of course, you know, if you look at the world population, 25% of the human being is Chinese. So, uh, so we're doing quite well. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. Anyway. Uh, of course, our neighbors, uh, Korea is a large group. Let's see, where is it? Korea, and uh, I think India is a big one. So the left is 37. Oh, here. So it's, it's starting to look more like a you know, uh, population distribution of the world. That means we are doing very well in terms of uh, fair recruitment. Uh, so Canada is a very small group, I guess, yeah. The U.S. is also very small, too, you notice. Uh, where is it? USA, four. Uh, we are making efforts to get more people from North America and Europe. But Europe, you see, if you add them together, it's very large. And uh, also, uh, we are trying to emphasize other Asian nations, like Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Mongolia, and so forth. Uh, let's see, yeah. So in terms of the, uh, in the eyes of the uh, Ministry of Education, we are considered one of the best institute in terms of having, you know, 
relations with many foreign institutions. What we have in the institute, facility-wise, we have a, this is what, uh, what you might call a foundry, where this part is a standard clean room, and uh, we have various equipment, like a lithography, ion beam uh, system. And this, so this is a fairly standard semiconductor processing uh, foundry. This part, bioorganic material facility, this one is interesting because you see usual semiconductor people won't let these messy things in. <laughs> you know, anything other than silicon or three, five compounds is a, is a dirt. But this part, we deal with a soft, when the people from the national government come to see this place, I always say, well, we, we deal with gooey stuff in this uh, laboratory, bio materials. And uh, we have a, the, probably the world's strongest magnet for uh, NMR. This one is uh, 930 megahertz, but now the new one is uh, 1.03 gigahertz, 1,030 megahertz. But the unfortunate thing is that last earthquake shook, shook up the score. And so we have to repair the whole thing. And that could cost several half a million dollars. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's the one problem. We have this uh, transmission electron microscope. That is, a, again, a very big one. Also, we run the uh, high field magnet laboratory for the nation. And we have a beam line in a place called Spring A. This is uh, far west, let's see, west of Kyoto. And we have a, a large synchrotron. And we have one of the beam ports for hard x-ray. And let's see. Some of the, well, OK, some of the things that we are doing that turned out to be very uh, successful is one of the things that's making most money for us is this thing called Cyalon. It's a silicon, aluminum, oxygen, and nitrogen combination. It's a cage like that. And then inside, you have uh, different metals. You, put, you can put different metals in it. Then they uh, light up in different colors, depending on what you stick, stick in. And the, the virtue of this thing is because of this cage, uh, it's very strong. Because uh, when you want to use this as phosphor, you want to shine UV or blue light on it and want to get the white light out, or blue, I mean red or green or controlled light out. <laughs> the amusing thing is people who, were, who developed this compound were looking for high temperature ceramic. They were not looking for uh, phosphor. But then somehow they realized you know, this thing lights up in different colors. And it turns out the patent for this is earning us something like $2 million a year. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, adventures, uh, people who invented it. It's a group of four people, I think, gets a quarter of the patent fee, which is a half a million dollar to split among uh, four people. So I keep teasing them, you know, maybe they don't need the salary. <laughs> they have enough. <laughs> anyway, uh, this, the, the reason why you can uh, get so much patent fee is because this kind of phosphor is very important in uh, getting LED lighting. You know, all these fluorescent lighting. This one comes, the white light comes from phosphor, mixture of phosphors uh, that is excited by mercury vapor radiation. But uh, 
the future lighting will come from LED, blue LED or UV LED shining on the phosphor and giving out different colors. And this phosphor is already used quite extensively in your um, cell phone display color. If you look at the, I think it's a sharp, is it? Yeah, I think sharp people use our phosphors to, uh, in their display. Uh, another one that's coming up in the news these days is this next generation super alloy. It's a high efficiency. You see, when you have a jet, jet engine, engines have these blades. It's like a fan. And uh, to get the efficiency up, you want to operate this engine at the highest temperature possible. And so that means you'd like a mechanically strong uh, metal that is, can stand high temperature. And the alloy that we have developed in collaboration with Rolls-Royce people uh, is used in this new airplane that just came off the line. It's called Boeing 787. And uh, the, apparently the, <laughs> the first plane that is flying now doesn't have the same alloy in the engine. But the, you know, Rolls-Royce makes different model engines. The next generation will have this particular alloy. It's a nickel, steel, and some ma ma magnesium and so forth. I don't know the com composition, but uh, that's supposed to be uh, one of the important contributions, sort of indirectly reducing the uh, CO2 emission in the world. Uh, Another interesting thing that I, this slide depicts is something called nanosheet. It's a monolayer of inorganic oxide uh, film that's very strong. And uh, what you can do is you create this thing. Uh, it's a compound with, uh, let's see, that's a nanosheet is a, is a What's the oxide of titanium? I think. Anyway, it's, uh, it's something that you can create and very strong so that uh, you, let's see, um, you can use it for filter, filtration of, it's with, with lots of nanopores. And uh, also, it, you can control its uh, directly constant and also you can pile them up with different layers, A, B, A, B, C, and so forth. So you can make a film with a controlled structure, depending on your purpose. Uh, let's see. What's this? Oh, OK. This, uh, this is for advertising to the bureaucracy. <laughs> Notice it says, you know, fiscal year here, and the number of uh, papers published is uh, on this side. Which slide is it? Oh, okay. This, this graph is the so-called impact factor, average impact factor of the papers published by our people, and this is the number of papers published every year is about, we keep around 1,000 papers uh, published by about 1,000 people, I guess, altogether. The, the interesting thing is you probably student, people who are still students are not worried about impact factors. Are you? Yeah? Students are? Faculty members. Faculty members are. How is it defined? Fun? How is it uh, defined, uh, the impact, impact factor? It's, uh, it's defined as a number of, uh, let's see, citations per paper, I think. Isn't that how it is? The total number of citations over a given paper divided by the, n oh, no, 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 that's not true. 
It's a total number of citations divided by the num total number of papers published in the journal, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it depends on the journal. journal is, uh, yeah, it depends on, yeah. So-called uh, high, high profile journal like uh, science, nature, they have very high values like uh, what, five, 10, yeah. somewhere around there. Also in biological sciences, uh, the uh, so-called impact factor is very large, like 10. So it depends on the field. So, so the usual warning people give you is don't count on it to be the single indicator. <laughs> anyway, so we, oh, this is another one of those statistics that we, want, we like to show. Notice NIMS was the 31st in the number of public uh, citations given to their papers. And the highest was Max Planck Society, Germany. And uh, Tohoku University is where I used to be many years ago, UC Santa Barbara, MIT, Russian Academy, and so forth. And so that was in two th this between, uh, between, before the two institutes got incorporated together. And uh, in 2010, we are about the fifth. <laughs> See? <laughs> as I was telling you, my predecessor, it, as the president, really liked the statistics. But the unfortunate thing is, when this was December 2009, we were the third. But then these people, National University of Singapore, is moving very rapidly. And of course, Chinese Academy of Science is very fast. I mean, it's big. So this is not per capita, but the total number. So, so China becomes the big uh, competitor. MIT still stands very, notice this is another Chinese university, Indian Institute. You see Santa Barbara down here now. So, you know, the uh, distribution of the uh, number of papers is changing very rapidly over the last 10 years. Okay, then we have various um, agreements and research collaborations, comprehensive agreements, and graduate schools. Okay, let's see, you, uh, where is Waterloo? Where? Oh, here. Yeah, that's the latest. Uh, we signed, you know, Professor Carty and I signed that last year. And so that's still the latest. Uh, we have various, okay, so the research collaborations, that's a fairly uh, straightforward uh, agreement. It's sort of like, uh, well, let's stay in touch. <laughs> fairly casual. So that's why there are so many. And probably some of them are not active and uh, collaboration with industries, we have that. Rolls-Royce, Leica, that's uh, camera people. Sangoban, that's uh, uh, glass people, French glass maker. And comprehensive collaborative agreements is, the th is what we were discussing with the uh, nims win combination, and that's where we are. And you notice there are many others but some of them are more active than others. And probably our collaboration with you will become one of the most active ones because many of the old ones are sort of petered out. <laughs> and also, you see, it all depends on who is eager to work in it. And you know, people who started some of these have retired and then the relation sort of dies off, then new ones come up. Okay, the important, another important thing is we have cooperative graduate schools. You know, we are a research institute, so we can't grant uh, degrees, but we do so by, in collaboration with established universities. So for instance, Charles University of, and, uh, and Parduchi, Pardubice University in Czechoslov Czech Republic, now, Charles University is one of the oldest in Europe. And uh, we take their students. What we do is the following. They train their students, uh, graduate students, first two years for master's degree. 
in the local, uh, in in this case it's in this case it's Prague. Then for the third, fourth, and fifth year of PhD, they come to us and do experiments with us, and. Some of our faculty, uh, no, some of our research people, are uh, given a joint appointment with the university, Charles University. So, uh, one of our staff member and the faculty member from the original university, they pair up to supervise a student dissertation. And the latest one is this one: Warsaw University of Technology in Poland. These people keep, we keep going back and forth. And uh, this is uh, India. Uh, Stony Brook, uh, let's see. There are some, oh yes, these are Chinese universities. This is Hungarian, this is Korean, and Moscow State Russian. Uh, so these are collaborations, cooperative. Then there's a even tighter, uh, collaboration with two of these universities, Warsaw University of Technology and Charles University in Czech Republic. They are, oh yeah, this is the kind of uh, collaborative research, uh, education in which our staff members are appointed, joint, you know, given the joint appointment from the, these foreign universities. So if some of you are interested in coming to work with us, uh, this agreement will allow us to sponsor you. And uh, the important thing is for you to decide, you know, what kind of research you want to be involved in. Then usually in material science and nanotechnology, we have somebody. Out of 400 staff members, there's always somebody who will probably match your interest. And you can get them to be your mentor. And uh, if you're an undergraduate, you can come for the summer months or for half a year as an, as an inter with an internship. And uh, if you're a graduate student, you can come for a year or two years. We usually support their living expenses locally. So it's probably not a bad deal. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh yeah, this is, okay, you probably don't, oh, you may want to know this. Okay, for PhD students, uh, let's see, let me take a look here. Oh, okay, so this tells you partner universities, if you belong to one of these, uh, you get travel expense and living ex allowance. And it depends on the, on the uh, agreement we have with different institutions. Uh, your condition will be sl slightly different. But uh, let's see. We still don't have you listed here as a collaborative university yet, program yet. More, we are more in the uh, research side. So perhaps we can do more, uh, you know, if there's, uh, there are enough students interested, we can make agreements to accept your students part-time or, you know, winter time or, let's see, maybe you want to send your students during winter when it's cold or, <laughs> <laughs> but if you come in the summer, it's hot and sticky in Japan. So maybe you want to come in autumn. Or spring. Anyway, oh, speaking of that sort of things, you know, people seem to be extremely afraid of radiation. Uh, from looking at it from outside, it looks like the whole island is uh, radiated strongly. But actually, you know, we measure the radiation level every day in our institute we get something like 0.15 microsievert per hour, which translates, assuming you're gonna sit there all year, translates into about uh, one, one and a half millisievert per year, which is about the same as a background 
radiation. So it's not bad. But for, for old people like me, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Something else will hit me before the radiation hits me. <laughs> so, but for young people, especially raising children, you want to be careful, but um, even then, yeah, it's sufficiently safe. Okay, uh, let's see, what do you have? Oh, okay, so this tells you more about the graduate program. Uh, oh, so you know this, see these uh, universities like uh, Charles University has eight students, PhD students actually working in our institute. So the nice thing is, you know, because the airfare has gone down quite a bit, you know, people can go back and forth. And their thesis advisors can come to DIMS and spend the summer with their students, for example. And uh, our facilities, are all, all our facilities are available. For instance, if you need a very high field magnet, you can use them, except now. Uh, we have to fix it. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Oh, here's the internship program, you see? We, we provide higher education to domestic or overseas. We do have some Japanese students as well, as foreign students. And uh, also, we, we benefit from having students among us. The reason is the following. Um, you know, national labs don't have seasons. You know, a year goes on and on. But when we have students, they come, some graduate, and uh, so they provide a great deal of stimulus to our uh, staff. And you know, it's always helpful to have students who keep asking questions, because often the most primitive questions are the hardest ones to answer. And uh, so I really like having students around. Of course, I spend most of my life with students because I was at the university until five, six years ago. Uh, okay, so students pay the travel expenses, but we pay for the accommodation and living allowance. We give something like, is that about $30 US dollars per day? Huh? Huh. Yeah, thirty dollars a day. That's not bad. Huh. Anyway, uh, so in principle, it's a short-term thing, like for your summer vacation, summer holidays. But uh, some people stay on for a long time, and uh, you know, take a leave of absence from your mother institution, but spend more time and then get more done. Uh, also, we. We uh, organized something called World Materials Research Institute Forum. This is a forum to, um, to meet with, uh, to have the, uh, mainly the administrative uh, directors of these uh, research institutes to meet together and uh, basically share our issues, problems, uh, make arrangements for collaboration, we have, the last one was held in Shenyang, China. And we had about how many people? Probably about 50 or 100 people gathered here. And in the, in the US, these are, the, I think, Office of ORNL. Oak Ridge National Lab, that's right. Let's see, do we have Canada here? No. No, in Canada. Okay, Europe has many, and Asia has many. So perhaps you can join this kind of things as well for, for in the future. Uh, we, have, we have something called National Nanotechnology Network. This is a network of, among universities, mostly, and uh, national labs. Um, 
to share nanotechnology related equipment facilities. And, and so we, we are here, National Institute of Material Science. We are sort of charged by the government to run this network and we organize. What it is is, you know, each place has, for instance, we have very high field magnet, for instance. And for instance, Tokyo University has a very high um, resolution clean room. Tohoku University is uh, here. I used to be here. And um, so as a, for the whole nation, uh, there will be the most advanced equipment available if you are willing to go to different places. And at the moment, most of the use of this facility is free of charge. And so you, you can uh, participate. Although we are trying to make it more global by uh, all the descriptions in English. But uh, it takes a while. <laughs> so it's not complete yet. Oh, this one is an interesting inst group. It's a subset of the, our institute, but it's called MANA, International Center for Materials Nanoarchitectonics. You, it's, a, it's a new word somebody made up, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a nano plus architecture. So you want to architect nanostructures to create some new material, new functions. And so, and we, we this is part of the uh, program called the uh, uh, World WPI, World Premier Institution Program that's run by the government. And we get something like 10 million US dollars per year to run this program. And you see, we, it's, we have each university, major universities have the, this program. Tokyo University has astrophysics. Uh, Kyoto University has stem cells. That's with the, uh, uh, you know, there's a fellow Yamanaka who discovered the way to create stem cells out of your skin cells. So, and Tohoku University has material science. So we compete with them. But I used to be there, so <laughs> I know all their people. Osaka University is good at immunology, and we are in nanotechnology. And just this year, Kyushu University, that's the southernmost university in Japan, uh, got this grant for environment and energy. So uh, you might think about visiting them also. <coughs> and so it's supposed to go on for about 10 to 15 years. And uh, let's see. Uh, for you, I think uh, the interesting part about this program is that this whole subgroup operates in English so that people who don't know Japanese can uh, work there. And uh, uh, I say it operates in English, but some, play, some staff members can't speak English. <laughs> so we have to, for this program, for this group, we have a special set of uh, administrative staff who speak English. And uh, you see, you, you people are very fortunate to be to have English language as your mother tongue. Maybe not for some of you, but uh, sufficiently mother, mother tongue, right? And uh, so, you know, hiring a regular technical staff, you can just hire somebody, ordinary people. <laughs> but in Japan, if you want to find somebody who speaks English, who writes English, uh, then it's very expensive. You have to find special people. So uh, I think you are lucky to be able to speak English naturally. 
maybe not naturally, but uh, you can use it. Uh, on the other hand, I sometimes say, I guess I said that to Professor Cardi, you know, if you're an English, if, you, the, if English is your native tongue, you don't have cultural privacy because most everybody in the world understands what you're saying. <laughs> you know, the Japanese politicians used to have terrible time because they were not aware of this, you know, that you know, more people are starting to understand Japanese. And they would say something that can be terribly offensive to foreigners. <laughs> uh, but in the English language, you can't say anything politically incorrect, right? Is that word used in Canada now? Some years ago in the US, people used to say, oh, that's not politically correct. <laughs> yeah, uh, anyway, uh, let's see. Let's go to the next one. I think I'm about finished. Oh, so some of the research projects that's going on at, in this group, which is specially funded, and uh, one of them is very interesting. It's an atomic switch. And it, you can make memories out of this. It's what it is, is uh, inside this, uh, let's see, is it here? Inside this, this electrode, is made of things like silver iodide. Then when you apply voltage, you know, silver is movable. So the silver atom comes out and the switch comes on. And when you reverse the polarity, it switches off. But uh, apparently, uh, these things have a learning curve. That is, if you connect, put it on many times rapidly, it will stay on after that even after you take the voltage off. So it's like memory. And NEC people are making memories out of these, learning memories. Uh, so, and this one is, uh, OK, this is an artificially created nano sheet that I was telling you about. You make a uh, langmuir Loget film, and then you accumulate layer by layer, and you can control the directly constant of this film, depending on the composition and the way they s make layers, like A, B, A, B, or A, B, C, A, B, C. For instance, graphene is something probably many of you are interested in. And uh, you can make uh, layered compounds, like graphite, with the desired or designed properties. Uh, let's see. This bottom one, you may not be able to see. Can you see this? This one has to do with the stint that you put, put into your blood, cell, uh, blood vessel. Uh, it's a metal, develop, we developed metals with certain coating so that the blood doesn't clot on the on this stint and it's I think it's coming up in the market very soon <coughs> uh, oh this is we call it green this is another project that we are running now with the support from the Ministry of Education the main point is this uh, that it's, uh, it's to contribute to the environmental health, but energy, we need energy. Okay, I, I wrote some of this part. My uh, idea was this. The reason why you end up polluting the environment is because the amount of energy we started to utilize has become non-negligible with respect to the capacity of the Earth, right? So what do we do? Uh, So-called fossil fuels are basically savings from the past, right? Because the, you know, solar energy came, uh, raised plants, dinosaurs, they die off, became coal and oil. So that's the savings from the solar energy of the past. And we've been eating off 
uh, the, uh, you know, our savings. But we haven't been using the current flow of solar energy as much as we should. So the idea is to be able to utilize the current income, that is the energy that's coming from the sun now, to meet our demands. That's not easy, but um, so for that purpose, we need photovoltaics to take the energy from the sun. And then we need to uh, uh, be able to uh, accumulate, save, store them, store the energy. Well, this one is, uh, again, fuel. You use the fuel, but uh, you get direct electrical power from it. So for that, this is a, basically a 10-year plan to come out with something useful, some useful technology, but to deal with the basics, basic science of that lie in common in all these issues. And it turns out that's basically a uh, problem of the interface between uh, liquid solid or li uh, gas solid or solid solid interface and how ions move or how electrons move across interfaces. So, well, I happen to be a surface physicist. <laughs> so I wanted to say, okay, it's the interface that's most important in all these issues. So I wanted to put the collaboration, the fusion of computation, uh, simulation, and uh, uh, computational science, and characterization. Use, use these, all these powers, scientific technological powers, to solve all these problems. That was the uh, story. And uh, I, we got funded. So I hope we'll come up with something that's useful. But this project uh, emphasizes the uh, basic science common to all these engineering issues. And what we are doing now, we are recruiting people from industries and also from universities. And uh, the purpose is to formulate a so-called all Japan team to attack this problem. OK, let's see. You don't need this. Oh, we do have various spin-off uh, venture industries. For instance, this one, they make, I think it's oxide makes, uh, what is it, a catalyst, I think. Oh, no, this one is lithium tantalate, lithium niobate crystals. Uh, some interesting ones. Probe, I think this one makes the uh, NMR uh, probe, special for uh, sol solids. Uh, super alloy, they make uh, alloys, that high temperature alloys. Uh, I don't know some of these. Okay. Oh, then we have various collaborations with industries. This one is a Rolls Royce. Not the car makers, but it's a jet engine maker. Uh, Sangoban is, uh, is this Sangoban? No. Oh, this is General Electric materials. Uh, Toyota, we, we work with them on various things like uh, batteries, uh, fuel cell. Uh, Sangoban, this is a glass maker, French company. We, deal, we work with them on uh, coatings on glass or uh, display, you know, the, you need a very flat glass on uh, liquid crystal display and you need certain coatings or insulating coatings. I think that's the end. Okay. Yes. How essential is it uh, for students who want to visit or study to know uh, Japanese? You don't need it. We try to make it so that uh, 
people don't have to learn Japanese. So all of the this yep. and everything is in Yes. Uh, with broken English, maybe, but <laughs> usable. <laughs> Yeah? Well, I think it's a question. Um, in the section that you just uh, showed two slides ago on batteries, there was an emphasis on this all solid state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. About what well, I think it's for uh, stability and safety. Mm -hmm. You don't use liquid, mm -hmm. so they don't leak. Mm -hmm. So is that motivated by Toyota or by yourself? Or? Uh, by our uh, people. So I'm not sure if Toyota is emphasizing that particular aspect in this, in our project. I don't know. Actually, I really don't know. But, uh, you know, people are trying to pick uh, electrodes that doesn't you require liquids. Oh, yeah, I know. So who are, who are the uh, academics you know? in Japan that you work with? Dr. Takada, uh, who came from Panasonic? Panasonic. Uh, he came from Panasonic. This guy, Takada. Takada. Oh, Takeda. Takada. Takada. Yeah, so we are doing, yeah, you can, we can find out more about it. Yes, did you want something? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, uh, Professor Ushiwata. Your, your national laboratory it looks very impressive. It's a, it's a quite an impressive laboratory. I was quite impressed that. Uh, how you 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 are taking the different disciplines and try to uh, to get these different scientific disciplines mm -hmm. or sciences to uh, to merge together. Yes. And uh, which uh, a lot of uh, a lot of us feel that uh, most of the innovations are going to come from this interdisciplinary inter interaction of these right. sciences. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the other question I have, uh, which probably is also a comment, is uh, in Canada. In uh, when uh, 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 when the government is supporting university research and also national laboratories, mm -hmm. they uh, they used to uh, pay a lot of attention or emphasis on the research impact. Mm -hmm. The way you you highlighted here, yes, which is uh, I, I used to be on uh, on the committees of NSEP where you, they used to give the money. Mm -hmm. they used to mm -hmm. pay a lot of attention to that. And that was in the 80s. Of course, now it's the zeros. And the zeros, of course, uh, it changed. The, the, the emphasis now is uh, how many of these uh, research laboratories and universities are, came up with innovations which uh, are commercialized. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, uh, technology, technology transfer. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, how is it in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in Japan? In Canada, there is a lot of emphasis on commercialization of innovations. But these politicians, of course, they don't realize that innovation, sometimes it takes uh, many years to commercialize. Right. It takes, uh, on average, uh, 14 or 15 years yes. to, uh, to commercialize them. So how is it in the environment well, in Japan? Well, <laughs> our, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting question to ask because I think maybe about 20, until about 20 years ago, you know, taxpayers were not that conscious about how their money is being spent. Yeah. And uh, so they were not uh, checking into what we are doing. <laughs> but now they are becoming very aware. So the industry people are pushing for short range results. The, on the other hand, um, you know, some of the things that I told you about uh, came from curiosity-driven research that happened to hit something useful, like that the phosphor. The guy was looking for high-temperature ceramic. And uh, oh, another one that's interesting, we, we just made an announcement just recently. There was a guy who was looking at these uh, nanopore uh, filter material that happens to catch cesium-137. And uh, you know, they didn't, he didn't know there would be cesium spread around here, around uh, in the atmosphere. But it turns out the, uh, the material that they put on the pores, inside the pore, 
likes to catch cesium. So that will be very useful in uh, uh, de de detoxifying the soil. So you see, as so, same thing is happening in Japan. That uh, you know, people want short-range gain. Uh, I always resist that, being a physics person. <laughs> it does, but uh, so we have to make a compromise and say, okay, we are aiming for something. We we often call it the uh, exit. And, uh, we may be at near the entrance most of the time and never get to the exit. But at least we have to define the exit. So we can still live that way. Yeah. And one thing that is impressive about Japan is that you, every five years, you have a basic plan we, uh, which sets out how much money you're going to spend in which right. directions. Right, yeah. And that, I think, uh, is um, uh, much smarter than. Canada has, yeah? has thought. It, it, it's, long, it's longer term. It's investing in, in basic research. Uh -huh. And uh, you, you, know, you expect outcomes. Yeah. Um, the question is, how will the basic plan be affected by the, what's happened in Japan? Earthquake? In the last year? Yeah, we are modifying. I was in, in the committee to formulate the five-year plan. That was you know, the, before the uh, fiscal year starts in April. So it was done in February. Then the earthquake hit in March. So we had to re revise it slightly. Maybe not slightly, maybe a lot. <laughs> uh, but uh, the basic idea is the same. That is, we are interested in uh, green technology and health, well, no. You see, the catch word in the current government is innovation. So this basic policy uh, document says green innovation and uh, life innovation. Those two are the two pillars that are supposed to help our economy. But uh, it, obviously, it's not going to do anything in five years. But it's a, it's a basic uh, direction that uh, you know, people are supposed to look. Yeah. This is not the place to uh, to argue this point here with respect to nuclear energy. But uh, you are a physicist. I am also a physicist of uh, physics background. And uh, your comment that uh, indeed uh, we made a big mistake uh, in the 60s and 70s when uh, Van der Bomb uh, basically ended up destroying uh, destroying the nuclear research. You know, so if we continue with the nuclear research, uh, uh, by, by today we would have found uh, ways to Probably. get rid of the nuclear waste. Uh, we would have found uh, ways to actually, instead of having these monster nuclear plants, we would have mini nuclear plants where we could actually control it, control the beast. Yeah. You know. And uh, but still, I think it's doable uh, to have mini nuclear. Uh, uh, stations mm -hmm. uh, which can be controlled and can be uh, can be shut down faithfully mm -hmm. uh, whenever they say. Anything. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. You know, I I think I guess Germany decided not to use nuclear anymore. Yeah, it's political. It's political, and uh, I I believe that uh, we always can find ways to overcome these difficulties. So I don't think we have to give up nuclear. We will have to be more careful, but uh, I think we should be able to continue to use nuclear power. But we, we need a nuclear research for health uh, That's right. uh, aspects. Right, yes. Let's take one last question here. It's like the question, I mean, it looks like school is a very crowded place because you also have this advanced industrial center, AIST. Yes. No. You see, Tsukuba was built in the 1970s to house, to put many of these national laboratories. Ours was one. Uh, IST is called Advanced, uh, IST is, uh, Industrial Science. Advanced Industrial Science. Uh, we have agriculture, uh, who else? Environment, uh, 
also KEK, that's high energy accelerator. And uh, uh, agriculture, Tsukuba University. So basically, it was built as a science city. And uh, interested, I'm glad that you asked that question because it's been there for 40 years, but then the government people started thinking, my gosh, we've put in so much money in that city, but there seems to be not that much impact coming out of the city. <laughs> and so we, are, we were just starting to organize our effort you know, with different institutes uh, to go after certain uh, themes, and this green stuff is one of them. And the ICE people are working more on electronics. And Tsukuba University works on all of those. Uh, and we are trying to, you know something about uh, Grenoble in France? They are doing very well in you know, inviting industries from all over the world. Also IMEC near uh, Brussels. They do the, very well. In fact, they get these people from in, in Brussels, they get many of our electrical industries, electronic industries, NEC, Panasonic, Hitachi, they are putting money there. And we say, why don't you guys put money here in Tsukuba? That's what we are trying to do now. But the interesting answer these uh, Japanese industry people give us, why they want to put the money in Belgium and not in Tsukuba. That's, they say um, they have to stay, have their hand in international collaboration circle because that's how uh, industrial standards are determined. So if you're out of it, you know, everybody else will decide the industrial standard. So it's an interesting, very interesting dynamics about industry, research, and uh, government. Okay, well, I think we've uh, finished our time. I just remind you before we thank Dr. Tishiyota that there is a reception oh. uh, in the fishbowl, uh, which you're all invited to. So please join me in and thank Dr. Tishiyota for his insights in the next. Okay.